Lots of commemoration today, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, and we will talk a little bit more about that in uh, this hour as well, because I don't know any more than you do about the um, who, uh, why, and all the rest of the continuing mysteries around the uh, assassination of Kennedy. Uh, There are all kinds of theories, and I notice that most of them uh, come from the, uh, the left. The wildest theories around come from people who are on the progressive left. And I thought for a long time that most of that has to do with the fact that, uh, as Jackie Kennedy said, he, her husband was killed, she said, by a silly little communist. The um, Lee Harvey Oswald, if he did it, and plenty of people, again, have theories about how he did or didn't, um was a defector, an American who defected in the in the height of the Cold War to uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis had just gotten through. In the height of the Cold War, he had defected to Russia. <clears throat> and I didn't even know Americans could get to Russia. How, how would you get to Russia in those days? They, they wouldn't admit you. Um, and um, not only did he go to Russia, but he, was, um, he, he suddenly got a Russian wife, which in those days pretty much meant you were given a wife that was a trained uh, foreign agent. And then, surprisingly enough, he was allowed back in the United States with that wife. Uh, I have no idea about any of that, but it's at the time, those details were very telling. I mean, no American went to Russia. No Russian, no defector came back to the United States. That was an, an unbelievable set of circumstances. So there was that. But I, and, and then there was Lee Harvey Oswald standing on the street in uh, New Orleans handing out flyers uh, to defend Castro and, and Cuba. So everybody since on the left has been trying to make him out to be some kind of, either, either he didn't do it or uh, he was a uh, you know, right winger. Uh, look at him, he was a Marine. He must have been a right winger. So I'll leave all that to the uh, conspiracy buffs. The fact, however, that affects us to this day is that the assassination of Kennedy, by whom and under what circumstance doesn't matter at the moment, for this analysis purpose, the fact that he was assassinated changed the country. And I don't think there's much disagreement about this. We felt before that impervious uh, to whatever bad things were happening around the world. They didn't happen in the United States. We'd won World War II. We'd uh, blocked the communists in uh, Korea. We were, uh, uh, you know, engaged in the effervescence of the of the fifties and the uh, the optimism and the unity. I mean, this was a country that, unlike today, when we sort of take for granted, we're divided along all kinds of different line earthquake lines here, fissures in the in the body politic. In those days, it was uh, pretty much eighty five, ninety percent. Uh, people who lived along a certain narrow spectrum of political thought. Uh, Everybody pretty much was anti-communist. Everybody was pretty much pro-free enterprise. We were very happy with the boom that had occurred in the 1950s, the optimism, as I said, the feeling, the good feelings uh, about being American, uh, being victorious, being prosperous, being a place where you could do, you know, any talented person with any kind of talent that applies themselves to it, could be a tremendous success in their field. And opportunities were endless and boundless, and all you had to do was work hard and, you know, work on those talents that you had, and uh, and you'd get somewhere. That was the universal feeling. I, I think there may have been, you know, some people uh, that didn't feel that way, but, boy, the vast majority sure did. And they weren't buying communism because the standard of living was going up. And going up dramatically. I mean, my father bought his first new car in 1955. And before that, he had jalopies, you know, through the Depression and so forth. He bought his first, he bought a Ford in 1955. He went in to buy a used car. He came out with a new one. He said, hey, they gave me the the terms that I I could have gotten the used one, but why didn't I just get a new one? Because it was that cheap. I think the car was something like 2,400 bucks. And that was a big, big money in those days, but he got it on a two-year loan. And they arranged for it, and he paid it off. This is a, um, you know, and the, the thing is, as a kid, I remember these times. And they changed completely after, after Kennedy. And this is, um, you know, things got worse. They got worse and worse. 
Reagan was an interlude for me because, again, he brought back the positivism. He brought back the shared optimism. He brought back the everything's possible, uh, apply yourself and get ahead kind of America that I knew as a kid. And then as an adult, I thought, wow, this is back. This is, this is cool. This is good. And, of course, that didn't last. And now we have a situation where it's just uh, unbelievable how far away from Kennedy we have come, how far away from that optimism the growth of the economy, the, the attitudes that he had about government, about, about um, cutting taxes. I mean, I don't know how long he was in office. It wasn't very long, a thousand days maybe, whatever. Um, and uh, he had 40 press conferences at which he just took, if you raised your hand, he would call on you. And he didn't know what the question was. He just, whatever the question was, he answered it. As opposed to the kabuki theater we have now, you know, where the questions are all pre-known by the president and he has a card in front of him where he acknowledges he's using the card to call on people in a certain order that have been trained to be called on and ask their question. Yeah, we used to live in a free country. I mean, the president of the United States came out and took all the questions, even the ones that were critical. And he had a great sense of humor about returning fire on him, too. But anyway, here's a CBS reporter asking the president about his idea about cutting taxes. Why would a Democrat want to cut taxes? Here's a cut, two. Mr. President, why do you think passage of a tax cut bill uh, important to economic growth? And what are your views concerning the relationship between tax policy, government spending, and the federal debt? Well, I'm for the uh, tax cut because I think it's essential if we're going to maintain a rate of economic growth which will provide uh, full employment and provide economic security for our people. Beginning in 1957, the economy of the United States flattened out. And in 1958, we had a recession which gave us the largest peacetime deficit in history. And then uh, 18 months later, we had another recession in 1960. That meant two recessions in three years. This affected our employment. It affected our profits, it affected wages, it affected our balance of payments abroad. Our feeling, therefore, is strong that if we can get a $10 billion tax reduction this year and next year, that this will multiply as it passes through the economy, as uh, it's spent by a consumer who buys a car, the automobile company then buys steel, steel pays a worker, that this will amount to a nearly $30 or $40 billion stimulus to the economy. We'll begin to get on top of our unemployment, which is now almost 6%. We'll maintain our economic growth without a recession. We will not repeat the history of the end of the 50s. So I believe this tax cut is essential. Could Ronald Reagan have said it any better? Could Art Laffer have said it any better? If you cut the tax rates and put money back in the pockets of people, the economy will boom. We have a Democrat in office today who believes the opposite, who believes that the more money government gets from you to spend, the more the economy will recover. That it's the spending by the government and not the spending by you that will recover us from this recession. Now, I think they've been proven wrong, given that five years in, uh, the economy has not recovered, as it should have much, much quicker and did in previous recessions. The 60s were boom years following those recessions of the late 50s. And they were boom years precisely because Kennedy cut taxes. He was on his way that day in Dallas, 50 years ago today. He was on his way to the Dallas um, auditorium where he was going to meet with a whole bunch of business leaders to get their support for the tax cut. And he had a speech in which he was urging the tax cut to give. So today, of course, there's a whole lot of people who want to deny that that kind of Democrat ever existed. Well, he did. And you heard him. And he was the guy who said the tax cut is is appropriate, is, is what we should do, because a rising tide lifts all boats. Just think how appropriate that is. A rising tide, that is a booming economy, lifts all boats. Now, you can sit down and refuse to get a job. You know, <clears throat> I'm sure you can be hurt by your own action. But for people who want more out of life, a better life for themselves and their families, a better job, better pay, 
and all that that money can bring for a better life for your kids and your family and yourself. A, an expanding economy, a growing economy, is the answer. Now, even Obama agrees with that. I mean, he's been, trying, he's been saying that for the last five years. We've got to grow the economy. And his theory is that if we tax you more and do more through government programs, it will restore the economy. It will restore growth. It will grow the economy. And he has now, as far as I'm concerned, proven once again... Since if that were true, Cuba would be uh, the leading, Cuba and North Korea would be the leading economies of the world. Um, It isn't true. It isn't working. And now I'd like to just pose this to Democrats in this audience. How about we go back to a Democrat like Jack Kennedy? 877-84, Roger, back after this. Don't forget to get our Highlight of the Week podcast by texting Roger to 203-00. All right, welcome back. 50 years on since the assassination of uh, JFK, and as far as I'm concerned, they have not been uh, great years for liberty. This is the last president, really, who talked, except Reagan, who talked about uh, liberty and freedom and the role of government in these in these terms. But he was also a take charge kind of guy. I mean, it's it was amazing how he was uh, not afraid to use the power of the presidency. If you go to the uh, presidential library in Massachusetts, uh, Kennedy's uh, library, they have, and, which by the way is not as visited. It is it doesn't have as many visitors at the library as the um, Dealey Plaza in. Um, Dallas has where the assassination took place. But they've got all kinds of uh, recordings. He recorded his, you know, before Nixon admitted that he recorded his phone conversations, Kennedy recorded his phone conversations, and those recordings are uh, on the old dicta belt, are uh, are available. For instance, he was um, talking to uh, Dave Hackett, one of his political guys, about the fact that the U.S. hockey team had gone to um, Sweden and gotten beaten. And very, very un-PC now when he tries to characterize what happened here in this, what was then a private conversation, which we can now listen in on. Mm-hmm. Yes, how are you? How are you? Dave, I noticed in the paper this morning where the Swedish team beat the American hockey team 17-2. to two. Yeah, I saw that. Christ, who are we sending over there? Girls? I know, they, they haven't won a game. I know it. I mean, who got them up? I don't know. I can check into it. But God, we got some pretty good hockey players, haven't we? Yeah, well, I think well, yeah. Well, I suppose they're all playing in their college teams, are they, or something? I'd like to find out whether it was done, under what, uh, who sort of sponsors it, and uh, what kind of players they've got, or, and because uh, I think it's a disgrace to have a team that's 17 to 2. That's yeah. about as bad as I've ever heard, isn't it? And they've been beaten by everybody by yeah. scores, uh, almost equal to that. Yeah, so it's, uh, obviously, uh, we shouldn't send a team unless we can send a good one. Will you find out about it? Let me I'll know. find out about it. Okay. Let me know. Find I'll out. find out about it. Let me know. Hockey team loses 17 to 2. <laughs> He's unhappy. Find out about it. Who are we sending over there, girls? I mean, this is fabulous stuff to listen in on this. And and this, you know, people, liberals now, this, you know, the guy, John Kennedy, who was a famous liberal president. He was famously fiscally conservative. He's also pro-life, by the way. But he was, for instance, this is a great, this is a great conversation. We played it earlier and I'm going to play it again. Um, this is a great conversation that had to do with the fact that uh, in the summertime they were at Hyannisport and uh, they were, uh, Jackie was about to give birth to their third child, Patrick, who unfortunately died in childbirth, but they had, over at Otis Air Force Base, they had a maternity room, a security room. They were concerned when they were out of Washington they didn't have enough security, so they put a security room in at the Air Force Base for the delivery. And Kennedy read in the papers, had to find out in the papers, that $5,000 had been spent on the maternity room and the furniture, and he was livid. Now, he knew these conversations were being recorded. Nonetheless, he couldn't help swearing, so a little bit of cursing here, so take that into account. But here's the president being very fiscally conservative about that $5,000 furniture job. Why to God, 
goddamn series, they ought to cut him a billion dollars. That's right, right. exactly. Yeah, I mean, you think of what the waste was on. It is, absolute nonsense. Imagine what they do if you didn't just stay in their ass. They're going to order three planes instead of one. Precisely. They're going to do all these. I mean, they, that's the way they, these guys spend money. I mean, oh, absolutely. They shocked if we don't. Now, the only thing is, it would seem to me, I'd like to turn that, I'd like to send that furniture back. Have they paid for it? I, I'll find out. Just on my own. I don't care. We own a store, but I just like to send that goddamn furniture back. It's probably worth about two fifteen hundred, two thousand bucks. What I asked him yesterday, where did the five thousand dollars go? Yeah. From the things they told me, I said, well, you couldn't have possibly spent five thousand on that. They've lied about it. Now I've gone back to them this morning and said, get the facts. And I'm sick of let's being find it. Yeah. Telling the president of the White House the wrong facts. Said, let's get the facts to begin with. Let's find out how much they spent on this thing. Uh, I mean, let's find out what they spent, where the money came from. Well, also, run down where if the bills have been paid, because a lot of the stuff we can just ship right back today. Right. I'll get I'd love to send it right back to John Marsh in an Air Force truck this afternoon with that captain on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about transferring his ass out of here in about a month? He uh, doesn't have any sense. Well, I had the for incompetence, it. not for screwing us. Exactly. Well, and I, that silly fellow who had his picture taken next to the bed, I'd have him go up to Alaska, too. But Pierre will be talking to you about that. Right. Okay. <laughs> the president's talking to an Air Force general. No one knows who that is, but it's an Air Force general on the other line there, and that's why he was talking about transferring the guy to Alaska. And, and just think of how Kennedy was willing, even on something so small, to you know punish people for incompetence, to call them out to demand that they have some common sense. If Barack Obama had done half as much, do you think healthcare.gov would be as botched? He hasn't called out anybody. He hasn't held anybody accountable. I think beyond all of the, beyond all of the ideology, listen to the leadership in Kennedy. He's taking responsibility for the waste at the beginning, he says, these guys would waste a billion dollars. They'd send three planes instead of one. <laughs> and, he's, and so he's, he's, he's not Barack Obama. He's a guy who's worried about the expenditures of taxpayer money, about the waste. And he's willing to call people to account and to name names and get, you know, get people into it. I, I thought it was just a wonderful insight into what Democrats used to sound like before they were taken over. By Obamanism. 87784 Roger on the web at rogerhedgecock.com. Chat rooms open, email coming in, Twitter at Roger Hedgecock. Facebook page is the Roger Hedgecock Show. And we'll be back with more. Stay with us right after this. Roger Hedgecock. Class for real Americans. And welcome back. I again want to emphasize there's a lot of these recordings you can access for yourself to listen to a different America. But as I mentioned in '63, it was also the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis and um, the idea that Russia tried to put um, missiles that would reach most of America into Cuba and that. The, it kind of precipitated a crisis because, obviously, the Americans uh, couldn't, uh, at least in that day and age, couldn't uh, abide by that kind of threat. And the Russians were, of course, trying to match the U.S. might in Europe, where NATO had pulled together a pretty big alliance to deter the Russians from coming in and taking the rest of Western Europe, as they had Eastern Europe in World War II. So... The Iron Curtain was, uh, you know, they were trying to push that, and NATO pushed back, and that was kind of a a draw at the time. So Russians went around that and said, okay, we've got this guy Castro down there from 59. We got him in office. Let's put some missiles down there and really, you know, in our next chess move here, put the United States at a disadvantage. So Kennedy has a blockade of of Cuba, turns away additional missiles coming in and these Russian... uh, Ships and then 
uh, and then there's a kind of a showdown. And there's this, there's a there's really a couple of days when we think we're on the brink of a nuclear war. And what does Kennedy do? <clears throat> he calls Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican president who preceded him, for advice. Now, again, just think about this in the modern context. A Democrat president, faced with a crisis, calls his Republican predecessor with a big military career and reputation to get advice on the um, on the crisis and their phone conversation is preserved you can go and listen to it here's here's a part of it listen i, I don't know we may get into the invasion business before many days are out yeah. but, uh, well, but uh, well, of course the military well, that's a clean cut thing to do now that's right because that's right. you you've made up your mind you've got to get rid of this thing. right well, the only real way to get rid of it of course is the other thing but it's having to be concerned with world opinion and, uh, and Berlin. Why you got to do a little slower. Well, Berlin is the, uh, I suppose, uh, that it may be the what they're going to try well, to trade off. might, but I, I, I personally, I just don't quite go along, you know, with that uh, thinking, Mr. President. My idea is this. The damn Soviets will do whatever they want, what they uh, think is good for them. Yeah. And I don't believe they relate one situation with another. Uh, That's right. what they find out they can do here and there and the other place. Yeah. Yeah. And we're we're already standing at uh, the unit with NATO that if they go into Berlin, that's all of it. Right. That means uh, they've got to to look out that they don't get a, a terrific uh, blow themselves. Right. And I, 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 I don't, it might be, I could be all wrong. So that was Eisenhower talking to uh, Kennedy. It was obviously taped from Kennedy's uh, phone because he's louder than, than Eisenhower is. But that's... Just, just a point I'm trying to make here is that in that America, they were Americans first. And when a crisis came, Americans pulled together. You know, and Pearl Harbor taught that generation that. That now all of a sudden it's all of us together against this aggressor and against our foes. And, uh, you know, today, gosh, there's, I, I guess we had a, t- a brief taste of that after the attack of 9-11 when the country really came together. But America used to be like that, like most of the time. In the era we're talking about now, 50 years ago today, shattered with the assassination of John Kennedy. What would have happened to John Kennedy after the, um, you know, that um, that day? We don't know. We really don't know. Except that uh, when Robert Kennedy was asked, for instance, uh, the liberals always say, well, if Kennedy had lived, there never would have been a Vietnam War. Kennedy was the one who ordered the troops into Vietnam. Eisenhower first, they were only advisors, but then Kennedy upped the thing. And uh, then, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy was interviewed just a few years after the assassination, and uh, the interviewer asked him, you know, about uh, about John Kennedy's attitude. Well, we wanted to win the war. Well, you mean he, he would have he would have gone into? Be- yes, of course. Yes. And that was before Robert Kennedy was, uh, um, you know, lurched left himself in 1968 and ran for president and then got assassinated by a Muslim. And that whole modern, that chasm opened up for modern America, even though many people didn't know it at the time. It didn't really equate the whole business of Sirhan Sirhan being a Muslim. Since then, of course, we've seemed to come to some grips with the fact that, oops, maybe this had something to do with it. Yeah, maybe. 877 Roger. On this 50th anniversary of that assassination, what are your thoughts? Even if you're too young to have known it, did it impact you? If you remember the day, what do you remember about it? What do you think has changed as a result of that assassination, if anything? What has it meant to you? 877-84, Roger. Now, in the meantime, let me uh, while we're at, uh, getting those calls in, let me ask you uh, about just another item that's come up because of Obamacare and has become even more prevalent now in people's minds and that is that their identity can be stolen. And it can be used by thieves to ruin your credit by, you know, getting a bunch of credit cards, running up a bunch of debts, and then you say, hey, they're not mine. I'm, that's not me. Uh, my name, but it's not me. And suddenly you're on the losing end of that thing. Well, that means you better get yourself LifeLock Ultimate. LifeLock Ultimate. These identity thieves are shrewd. But LifeLock Ultimate is the most comprehensive ID theft protection ever created. Not only does it help guard your identity, your good name, and your credit, 
essential, right? But goes beyond that to monitor your bank accounts for takeover fraud. This uh, LifeLock Ultimate got awarded the best in detection among identity protection services. The best. LifeLock Ultimate, the new science of ID theft protection, but they cannot protect you or your bank accounts if you're not a member. So, as a special holiday gift, LifeLock is offering my listeners 15% off your LifeLock Ultimate membership. Call LifeLock or visit LifeLock.com. Use the promo code ROGER15, promo code ROGER15, for your 15% off holiday gift. Call 800-LOCK-475, that's 800-L-O-C-K-475, 800-LOCK-475. Now, the network does not cover all transactions. Scope may vary. Offer ends 12-31-13. Now, today, just by way of contrast to what you just heard of how America used to be 50 years ago, um, John Kerry, the Secretary of State, has uh, flown to Switzerland, to Geneva, quote, with the goal of continuing to help narrow the differences and move closer to an agreement, unquote. If you've been following this negotiation with the Iranians, just to bring us to modern America, in Eisenhower's day, (laughs) the Iranians tried to elect a communist uh, in uh, 1954. They engineered some kind of a deal where they would um, try to placate the Americans by having a so-called election like they do now in, in, uh, in Iran. And a guy named Mossadegh got uh, elected, who was a, a Russian plant. And the CIA simply went in and uh, through the supporters of, um, you know, the anti-Mossadegh people, uh, overthrew him, and uh, the Shah took power. So all we wanted, we didn't, you know, it's up to the Iranians what kind of government they want, except you can't become a pawn of the Russians in this game, international game, of um, of the two uh, warring, uh, well, not quite warring, but almost at the edge of warring uh, superpowers between Russia and the United States. So today, <clears throat> we're begging Iran, uh, won't you please give us some kind of fig leaf so that we can say we've stopped your nuclear program, and they keep saying, well, no, we're entitled to a nuclear program, we're going to develop a bomb, and we're going to annihilate the Israelis because we're entitled to kill all the Jews, because if we do... Then uh, the uh, Mufti, Moga, whatever his name is, uh, comes back, and it's the uh, triumph of Islam over the entire uh, world. Now, you know, once you believe stuff like that, negotiation, you know, is, is fruitless. It's ridiculous, it's ridiculous, really. The only thing that's going to stop Iran from getting a nuclear bomb and trying to annihilate Israel is stopping Iran from getting the bomb physically stopping them from getting the bomb. And how you do that, there's a number of different ways to do it. I thought it was very clever to send in the Stuxnet virus to try to ruin their computers and keep them from developing the centrifuges but uh, to, so they could get the uranium for the bomb. But that's, you know, that apparently they've overcome that. And that was very clever. But in other words, you're going to have to do something to stop them from doing because they're not going to negotiate away their intention to do it because it is in the service of God himself. And I want you to understand that all of this is nonsense. So what's happening in Geneva is that the Iranians are continuing to jab the Americans to give in more and more. In fact, their latest demand is we want all of the sanctions relating to finances and the oil market to be lifted before we talk anymore. And believe me, they'll do more and more of that. I mean, we'll be paying for their nuclear program probably in the next round of demands. Um, and by the way, they're, they're taking a leaf out of the pl- uh, playbook from Harzai, uh, uh, Hamid Karzai in, uh, in Afghanistan, who's now basically said, you know, you guys want to stay and spend a lot of money here uh, in my country, but um, I'm not going to sign this agreement until, well, there's not enough in there for me. You know, me and my brother, we, we, you know, we need more, and gosh, uh, there's a lot here. I, I give you that, but uh, there, could, there could be more, so we're going to uh, play you a little more. And the Iranians are looking at this and laughing. Because the Obama administration is going, okay, well, we're, uh, we'll give you another deadline. Our deadline was November 1, now it's December 31. And today the Afghanis said, well, we don't care about your deadline. We'll talk to you again in January. Because they know Obama will cave. He's that bad in foreign policy. Yes, he's that bad. Peace through weakness is his motto. Peace through giving people things so they don't think ill of us. Peace through caving in and bowing down. 
so that they don't think we're the great superpower and they'll leave us alone. So now John Kerry is going to, uh, you know what his message is in Geneva? John Kerry's message in Geneva is exactly this. Uh, why won't you say yes to our surrender? And of course the Iranians will look at him and say, because it's not enough. We want your humiliation, like you're getting in Afghanistan. 877-84, Roger, back after this. Every week we make a special podcast of the best few minutes from the show. You can get them sent right to your phone. Just text Roger to 203-00. All right, feedback now on the um, Kennedy topics. Uh, Frank in an email says, Roger, the State Department, uh, we were talking about how Lee Harvey Oswald, having defected to the Soviet Union, got back into the United States. How'd that happen? And as well with a Russian wife. State Department uh, says Frank was responsible for Lee Harvey Oswald returning to the United States. They issued him a U.S. passport and his wife a visa. This is the same State Department that assured us at the time that Fidel Castro was not a communist, just an agrarian reformer. I believe that Joseph McCarthy was right. Our State Department is full of communists. Well, it's certainly proven later that it was full of people sympathetic to the communists. Um, In key positions, by the way. All right, to the phones. Here's Jerry next. Jerry, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. Uh, You had mentioned that the divisiveness of uh, today wasn't near as bad then as it is now. And I'll stipulate that. But it was bad then, too. The John Birch Society was thriving in those days, and there were guys walking around happy that the president had been shot. I was 23 at the time, and I remember it distinctly. Yeah, there were some of them. And I think the uh, there was also the John Birch Society was active against Earl Warren as the chief justice, having been uh, nominated by, uh, by Eisenhower. Uh, there were people like that. There were also people on the left. Uh, Henry Wallace and his followers and acolytes were uh, very sympathetic to the Soviet Union, very unhappy about our anti-communist sen- But again, they were people who were, I think the most of the population viewed them as the fringe that the great mass of Americans Uh, still had the World War II mentality of unity and Americans, and we're all Americans. You know, we didn't have the hyphenated, you know, Greek Americans. We talked about, the Greeks talked about being Americans. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. I agree. I agree 100% that it's much worse today, and and the the chasms that exist today are just embarrassing. I don't like it one bit. But it, no, wasn't, I don't it wasn't Pollyanna back then either. Oh no, and I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to say that. I said that there were. I said eighty-five percent. So you know, I mean, I, obviously there were people on the fringes, and there was extremes, and there were people uh, better read than dead, and there were people on the right who were talking about uh, assassinating this and that, and I, of course. But again, I think the great. Held, held, my mother held meetings in her basement about how to get rid of Kennedy. Yeah, but they weren't talking about killing him. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, even my dad. My dad voted for Nixon, and that night, I remember distinctly, he came home from work, and uh, we sat there kind of glumly at the dinner table, and he said, I was pretty young, and he said, uh, you know, I didn't vote for him, but but they shouldn't have killed him. And that's just, uh, yeah, I, everybody I think that that's... Feeling. I distinctly, distinctly remember that day. It was a horrible day. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Jerry, thanks. 877-84, Roger. Now... Uh, to um, Leslie next. Leslie, welcome. Hi. 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 Um, yes, my first time calling. Thank you, Roger, for being a wonderful radio talk show host. I enjoy it very much. And I wanted to comment on one of your questions regarding what I thought happened after JFK was murdered. And um, one thing is that, you know, our country was, through Johnson's legislation, shot into socialism probably uh, farther than we could ever have imagined. And um, with all the social programs and um, also I wanted to comment that I do believe that JFK was murdered um, by, by more than one person and that it was, it was something that was set up. So that's my comment. 
Okay, Leslie, thanks. I appreciate the call. Yeah, I, you know, I've gone, gone around and around. There must be 10,000 books on the assassination of Kennedy, uh, on all these uh, crazy conspiracy theories and some not-so-crazy conspiracy theories. And I thought, you know, we'll, we, we don't know. I don't know how we ever will know. I don't know whether any f- facts will emerge over the years. I was sort of hoping this would be resolved by somebody finally on a deathbed, you know, confession or something. And nothing's happened. Whatever did happen that day, and we may know everything there is to know. Who knows? Uh, it seems, uh, I must say, from my own perspective, it seems implausible, but not impossible, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did the uh, all those shots from that window. There's certainly no great proof that there's anybody else involved, and I think all the nonsense about the CIA is simply to cover the fact that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was a communist uh, and that he uh, was active in uh, in trying to protect Cuba and was very unhappy about the anti-Cuban uh, stance that um, in the earlier that year that Kennedy had taken, as we just heard in that conversation with Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the that Kennedy had taken the stance of being against Castro and so forth. And uh, he was, Oswald was so unhappy about it that he was distributing leaflets on the streets of New Orleans in support of uh, Castro and the revolution in Cuba. So I think because of that, you got guys like Stone and, and the movies that come out and so forth trying desperately to shift the attention to the CIA or the State Department or the John Birch Society or whoever on the right that they can possibly blame on this thing. I mean, I mean, Rush Limbaugh wasn't broadcasting that year, so they couldn't blame Rush, I guess. So they, had, they come up with something to be able to, um, to pin the blame on somebody. But again, I just think that's a, it kind of irrelevant. I mean, the, the fact that he was assassinated and the impact it had is much more important to understanding today's America than the mystery about how it happened, although that's interesting. Just like the uh, the death of Lincoln uh, before him, and I'm not comparing the two, but I'm just saying the, the, depth, the uh, aftermath of the assassination was that we were a changed nation. We were not the same nation. And I think Lincoln would have been a lot more adept at pulling the country back together than his successors were. But that, of course, is all conjecture, and we don't do that here. We do fact. And we have some fun doing it, too, don't we? Thanks for being there. Have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday with a lot more. I appreciate your being there. Thanks for listening.